Now look at 1 Corinthians 12, and I encourage you to read that for homework. You have lots of homework tonight. Mike Barr, you have lots of homework tonight. We won't read the whole thing, but here it is. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Verse 14. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. The body is not one member, but many. The body is not one member, but many. Verse 27. You read the whole chapter, it's good. Also, you'll, you'll, you'll catch how he walks out this revelation to his church that he started. He talks about the body and then he also goes right into love. It's like you have all this stuff, you gotta got love. Now you are the body of Christ, members individually. And this is the church. I believe Paul helps define the church that God is building. And you also notice it is not just a minor theme. He has it in, the, in, 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 these, in these epistles. And God has appointed these in the church. Notice it's God who appoints them. God who appoints them. God who appoints them. So I emphasize that point. It's God who appoints. I love you. He went to the prophetic seminar with Bishop Hammond. Love him. Great pioneer. But you is not a prophet unless God said. I don't care if you got a certificate. I don't care if they put oil on you. I don't care if they shundied over you, blew the show, everything. It doesn't, that does not register. Men and women can only publicly recognize what God has already called. And part of the reason people are so wanting titles is because they don't understand how beautiful they are just being who God called them to be. We'll touch that title thing in a moment. And God has appointed these, and the, this is the church that God is building. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administration, and variety of tongues. I like that. That's a Pentecostal scripture right there. <laughs> variety of the tongues. Are all prophets, are all, uh, are, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do, I'm spitting now. I'm doing good. Do all speak with tongues? Do, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. And then he talks about, uh, obviously, the concept of love. Now, again, another of his epistle, Ephesians 4. You'll see almost the same language here. I, therefore, this is Ephesians 4, verse 1. I, therefore, prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called with all lowliness. You'll also emphasize this point of humility in God. If there was ever a guy who could boast, it was Paul. I'm not a big movie person. I, I don't have, a, I, like, I get nervous. I can't watch the whole movie. Like, I just, like, got to get up and do something. I can watch a whole wrestling show, but uh, not a movie. But one movie that will be worth your time is the Apostle Paul. They depict him exactly how I see him. With all lowliness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of spirit and the bond of love. There is one body. And one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. Notice, he also emphasizes that individual calling and individual purpose. We'll, we'll segue here for just a moment. And you also see in Paul's letters, you never find office preceding personhood. You never, say, you never have Paul say, uh, the apostle Paul. It's always Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. When I talked about Nathan the prophet, it was uh, uh, it was Nathan the prophet, not the prophet Nathan, because office and purpose never precede the office. It's always, excuse me, personhood never precedes someone's office. You're defined by who you are in Christ Jesus, and that is just an office that you carry in it. And so the goal, we'll talk about it in a minute, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and, and the Father of all, who's above all, through all, and in you all. Verse 7, but to each one grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. This is a really important point right here. He led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. Now, this he ascended, what, is also, what, what does it mean? But he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things, that he might fill all things. Then he might fill, that's an important verse, because he's saying, I gave you these gifts 
to fill the earth with the knowledge of God. I didn't have all the verse in my notes here, so I want to jump back to it. Verse 11, and he himself, again, he emphasizes this, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth and love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body of Christ and edifying itself in love. So uh, let's look at this here. Really important here. So Jesus, he's saying Jesus himself, the one who ascended, is the one who descended, which is uh, the son of man who's in heaven. He's talking about Jesus is given these gifts to the church. And Paul finds imagery in Psalm 68. Psalm 68 was a picture when David would win victory in battle. He would put all the spoils on a mountain so the entire nation would see what they had won in battle. And so Jesus is saying, I have, I have died, gone to hell, ascended, and now have resurrected, and this is part of my gift to you, to the church I am building. I give you men and women, men and women. Let me just say that since I'm in the South. I know it bothers some people. Men and women. I believe a woman can do anything a man can do as long as God called her to do it. And when the gospel is properly preached, women are liberated. It's one thing Pentecostals did well. They always welcomed the women who were called. It's quiet with that one. It's true. I didn't hear the Methodists ordaining women for a long time. But he says, I gave you these gifts. I gave you an apostle. Why? Jesus functioned in every one of these offices. So he gives these offices and he gives these equipping graces to the body of Christ so that you could grow. And if you're missing one of these graces in a local body, operating through, if it's not on the team or if it's not coming through, people will be deficient. Pastor Tracy, I don't know if you know this, but I have the body of a bodybuilder. I do. Totally do. I got triceps. I got biceps. I got legs. I do. I got every part of it. I got a body of a bodybuilder. You cannot deny that. I did not make an untrue statement. The difference between a bodybuilder and myself, I'm better looking than most of them. But the point really is that they have chosen to develop their bodies in a greater measure than I ever will or ever care to. So they have developed something. And without these graces, this is also really important, because many people never go beyond the expression or the, the, the stream by which they got born again in the body of Christ. I, 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 I don't say I've arrived, but I made a decision a long time ago. I want it all. I want every part of what God's doing in the earth. But often to receive from those other streams, you'll have to often get delivered of judgments in your own mind. So the apostle, apostle is sent one. Jesus was the ultimate sent one. He came with a mission. He came with a purpose. Apostles see purpose and the ability to build into those purposes years in advance. They have no interest in what people feel or where people are at. They have interest in what God has said and building that. 
But Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Not that every believer is an apostle, but every believer should have an apostolic grace functioning. You should understand the reason for which you came to earth. Not full understanding, not like you got it all figured out, but you should understand the journey that you're on in Christ Jesus. There should be no coasting. If you can figure out your life purpose or how you're going to finish the years of life on the earth, well, you know, I've got three more years and I'll retire. It's nice. Go to the lake, play golf. That's American. I'm not saying you can't enjoy your, please enjoy your life. But if that's the extent of your life. I remember years ago, very famous or, or story that he's told around the world, famous John Bevere story, is that he was working at IBM. He's actually a very brilliant guy, engineer. He's working at IBM at a Purdue, <clears throat> and a guy retires. And, uh, you know, they have this party for him. <clears throat> and a young John Bevere looks at this guy. He's like, well, what are you going to do now? He goes, whatever, how many years he'd been working there. He goes, I've hated this job every day of my life. My, basically, I have just had a vision to finish this thing so I could really do what I wanted to do. The guy was not on the earth within 24 hours of making that statement. Apostle, sent one. Jesus was the greatest pastor. He was the good shepherd of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He was the greatest pastor that ever existed. He had compassion. He left the 99 for the one. Now, but there's also a truth in there that often as Westerners we miss, and it's this. The Hebraic mind would understand this, that the reason, part of the reason he is leaving the 99 for the one is because the, the, the whole is missing something without that one person. So he was the great pastor. He taught truths that people were astounded and their hearts came alive with the message. He expounded upon. By the way, Jesus believed in the old covenant more than many preachers today. He's the one who made the statement in Matthew 13. When a scribe is fully trained, he brings out things old and things new. He was teaching a truth there. He said, you cannot understand what I'm saying unless you understand what God has first revealed to his chosen people. The greatest teacher. He was the greatest prophet that ever lived. He answered questions people were not asking. But they were thinking. The goal, though, was not to make more profits. The goal was to release a revelatory realm so people could hear and think for themselves. He was the greatest evangelist. He preached the message of the good news. That's why people came. He did miracles where John said, for all the books, the books of the world could not contain all the things that he did. So without those anointings and graces equipping you, you might have a big upper body, but weak legs. So you need all these graces to build God's people. And why are we emphasizing this? Because we're talking about the concept of mature people. And mature people have the ability to receive from multiple anointings and multiple graces. And there's a grace, too, in how, certain, how these offices function few months unless God really speaks to me. Hey, great, great uh, man's who become a mentor in my life. He's a teacher. He's older too. So we're not going to do worship for an hour. Why? He's a teacher. He's 75 years old. He doesn't need an hour in the glory. He needs to come up and give the message he has. See, that, that bothered some of you because you like to worship. But you have to understand sometimes in maturity the anointing you're receiving from in that moment. quiet with that one. I know you're river people. <laughs> you got to understand sometimes the anointing you're receiving from. 
When I'm around generally Word of Faith people, I've never got a wor Word of Faith worship album. Never. But I've gotten every one of the teachings. <laughs> got quiet with that one too. I'm, being, I'm a very honest person. I didn't come there for the worship. Came to hear from an office of the teacher. To be equipped to hear truth expounded upon. Now I go to a Benny Hinn meeting, you know it's going to be six hours in the glory. Oh, the glory. And sometimes, I'm going to be very honest, sometimes I get confused when Benny starts teaching because I don't know what he's talking about. Because that's not his strength. Got quiet with I'm not disrespectful, I'm telling you what I think. Anyway. Um, there's different types of meetings. Different types of ways of equipping people. If you don't even realize it, I've been prophesying since I stood up here. We're discerning, we're teaching, we're expounding. It's another mark of maturity, the ability to properly be able to receive to a grace that's in the room. I've seen people miss what God had for them in a certain expression because they were looking for it one way. Remember, years ago in one of our uh, actually very first um, weekend we hosted as a ministry, 2013. It was so glorious. God moved powerfully and people encountered the Lord. And I'm walking out, lady, nice lady, partner of mine. And she said, I said, I said, it was a great weekend. She said, I said, yes, but I didn't get a prophetic word from you. And I left so disappointed. So I thought, the greatest one, the greatest prophet was in the room. By the way, I prayed for people like two sessions, every person in the room. So she had to have it one way. And she was disappointed. Because there was an immaturity there that could not discern how to receive what God had for her in that moment. The Lord talked to me about seven years ago about the church. When I make these statements, I'm not saying that there's not a place for improvement. I believe, like the church, church is like, uh, God gave me this analogy. It'll offend probably most of you, but I think it's right. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is like the Donald Trump presidency. <laughs> it's got a lot of dysfunction, but it was the will of God the first time around. I'll get quiet with that one. And I believe that he became president to show a lot of believers how religious they were. And I also believe he's not president now to show a lot of believers how religious they are. God just laughs up there sometimes on these things. The Lord began to talk to me about the church one day. He said, when I look at my beautiful church, I do not look at it through the lens of a critic or one with harsh judgment. I view my church through the lens of a loving father who has just seen the birth of his first and only child. I see the end from the beginning. I see a victorious church overcoming every challenge of identity and fully living in the inheritance that I've freely given it to him. I see young and old coming together to form a remnant of people who will be architects of a culture of the kingdom that has never been fully expressed but is my great desire and will. When I see my church, I see people moving with the same compassion that my son had when he ministered to the multitudes and walked the earth. When I see my church, I see a company of people who will stand on a sure foundation of the kingdom that will never be shaken. When I see my church, I see an army of warriors who will overthrow strongholds of darkness that have existed for thousands of years and replacing them with kingdom realities. When I see my church, I see a people who, as they align with me, will release the most beautiful sounds the earth has never heard and will open the eyes and the very ground to receive the glory of God in an unprecedented way. When I see the church, I see billions who have yet to come into the saving knowledge of my son, but whose eyes will be open on the appointed time to see the king. I see my people coming into a realm of creativity the world is yet to see, that I would be glorified in every sphere of society. Yes, there are inventions to be discovered and solutions to society that currently have not been discovered, but they are hidden in my heart for my children to discover. 
These divine discoveries will bring great joy and substance and be a blessing to the earth. I see my church vastly different than many of my people and even in those key positions of leadership over my church. I'm calling my people to see my church as I see my church. Reformation is my will and purpose for my people. To see my church and exist as my church and to see how I see become reality. I have no other plan for the earth except that which would be birthed through the church that I promised to build and the gates of Hades would not prevail. So I'm not saying we don't have challenges. I'm just saying God sees us a little differently sometimes than we see ourselves. And it's kind of like easy to just poke their eye, you know, this is bad, that's bad. Yeah, I agree. But he still loves us. And there's a lot of people doing it well and trying to do the very best they can. It's also important to discern where God has called you to connect. And the point in the job of a five-fold ministry is not to replicate people who preach and teach like them, but to they might have the same grace or same office, but the goal is to encourage them to be originals and who God had created them to be. One of my goals in discipling people is to encourage them to become how God intended them to become. It's like, how do you come up with messages? Pray. <laughs> it might not be the most ex- 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 like talented and gifted thing you'll hear, but you will, you will have something to say for the people. Sometimes in discipleship we have this, and, 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 and you, you know, you, it's, it's not even a bad thing. I can, you know, when I listen to some people pray, I can hear kind of their influences and stuff. That's good because, you know, I, I, I pray like my parents sometimes because they influence me and I pray like my mentor. So that's not bad. But the, 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 the greatest thing you can ever be is yourself and receive from those different graces that you're listening to. We don't need 30 more Todd Whites in the earth. Love him. I think he's a great gift. We don't need 80 more Benny Hins in the earth. We need people to receive from those graces and become who God intended them to become. I'm almost closing, but not really. To become like him, you must learn how to think like him. I heard this statement from uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes. He said, when I'm listening to someone minister, I'm not, trying, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not only trying to receive what they're saying, but I'm trying to learn how they're thinking. Psalm 103 verse 7 says this, He made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. Isn't that fascinating? You can be around the acts of God. You can be around the things of God. You can actually even experience the things of God, but never learn to live in his ways. Often, and that's, that's one of my great passions, often from pulpits, unfortunately, we are hearing the echo of other voices. We are not hearing things people have actually heard. I love the apostolic uh, uh, words that John writes. We have seen and declared to you what we have seen and touched ourselves. Ways, and that verse says, or Psalm 103, he made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. Way is a path or a journey, a manner, custom, conduct, a way of activity. So we want to be on this journey of the Lord teaching us his ways. I made a commitment to the Lord many, many years ago. I said, I don't just, I don't just want to like see you do stuff. I want to learn how you do it. To become like him requires that you recognize your need for him.